Our scripture today comes from two places, the Old and New Testament. One is from Proverbs chapter 22, verses 1 through 9. The second will be from Galatians, which is Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, chapter 5, verse 1, and then verses 13 through 15. I invite you to follow along on the screen, or you can look it up in your Bible or your electronic device. From Proverbs 22, the author writes, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. In the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. Start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, and the rod they wield in fury will be broken. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. And from Galatians chapter 5, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Give us eyes to see the world the way that you see it. Give us ears to hear your voice. And give us hearts to receive what you would give to us today. And then empower us with boldness. Make us bold, God, as we go out into our world to live as your hands and feet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anybody else having a little bit of the sniffles? I think mine's more allergies than anything. The leaves start falling. The harvest comes in and my allergies seem to react that way. So this is our fourth and final week in our series, Living the Dream. And as is uh, a custom of the church, October's stewardship time, and it's everyone's favorite time of year for sermons, right? (laughs) Living the dream. We've shared with you each week that the American dream was a phrase first coined by an author in the 1930s, an author by the name of James Truslow Adams, and he wrote this. The American dream is that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. The dream. Kind of sounds like the promised land, doesn't it? wonder where he got this information. I don't know. But the American dream, it's not a concept that is necessarily contrary to or opposed to a biblical way of life. But we humans, we have a way, we have a history of taking something good and we twist it just a little. We twist it just a little until it becomes something that that doesn't resemble what it started off being, that something good. And when this dream becomes our chief objective and we begin putting our pursuit of this dream before our pursuit of God, herein lies the problem. The dream becomes an idol, thus becoming our God. It's what we live for. It's what we worship. We begin to worship the dream. Many have gave up much to pursue this dream only to realize whenever they finally got to the destination they thought was the dream that poof it really didn't exist 
Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. What he meant was make pursuing God your primary objective, your primary goal. And joy and peace and happiness and contentment, they are surely going to follow along with blessings of the necessities of life told that in the context of you know birds don't worry about what are they going to eat God provides them everything they need why should you worry about the same life is more than food and clothing so why do you spend time worrying about those things seek first the kingdom of God the American dream How would you change? How would our world change if our dream was transformed into becoming people who love deeply and serve humbly? People who forgive mercifully. People who give generously. And people who follow Jesus passionately. You think our world would be a better place? You think you would be more content if that became your dream? Begin our series, week one, Susan shared with you about being weird, uncommon, or different. Weird. And in our society, today weird is defined as someone who owns their home, doesn't have a mortgage, or lives in a dwelling, an apartment that is actually something they can afford. Owning their cars, owning their automobiles, not having a loan or a lease, but they're theirs paying cash for everything, living within your means, being wildly frugal so you can become wildly generous. That's weird. That is not how the rest of the world operates. We know this, correct? Shake with me. Positive affirmation. Very good. Positive, Positive affirmation. Pastor needs it. Week two was insanity. We defined it as doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting to get different results. Doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting that the outcome will be different this time. This time you will be surprised that what you've been doing over and over again, suddenly it all works out just as you thought it would. But yet you still wind up the same place you always were. The outcome won't change until something in the process changes. And we seem to get caught up in this cycle of insanity in our world, which is translated into earn more, spend more, worry more. That's what the cycle is. Earn, spend, worry. Earn, spend, worry. And we don't worry about things that we need. We seem to worry about affording something that we want to do or going someplace that we want to go or paying for something that we have already bought that we are now enjoying that may not be shiny and new anymore, but we're still paying for it. We don't worry out of our need. We seem to worry out of our greed. What will you do if you are caught in the cycle of insanity? What will you do to break that cycle? What needs to change in your process so that that is not your cycle of insanity? Week three, more. Our culture, our world is a world of more. Excess, excess, excess. And most of us, we dip our toes into the pool of more and then we dive in head first and we are swallowed up by the black hole of more because more has an insatiable appetite and more will never be satisfied. There's never enough of more. And most of us don't have an earning or a spending or even a debt problem. We have a contentment problem because we cannot get enough of more. We crave more. It's the way we were created. We have this void. And we keep trying to fill it with more. The only thing that completes us, the only thing that that leads to a place of contentment is Jesus Christ. So, what needs to change so that you seek to get more of God? Hopefully leading to a place of contentment and peace. Seems to me that our adult life, we all start off with very simple desires, don't we? Very simple desires. Most of us start off our adult life. Our only desire is to pay the bills this month 
and have enough left over to go to the grocery. And then life gets a little better, perhaps a little easier, and the dream gets a little bigger and a little fuller. And our culture drives us to attain material possessions that we think we own. But the reality is, is that most of our possessions end up owning us. We end up working for our stuff. And we convince ourselves that we deserve it. We're convinced. We deserve it. We work hard. And before we know it, the dream holds us captive. And all we long for at that point is to be free. We desire to be set free. And that is why Jesus came, to set us free. Set at liberty the captives. To set us free from the bondage of sin, from the lies of the world, from a life of emptiness and meaninglessness. Desires to set us free. And until we surrender our dream... For God's dream, we will not be free. And that's where we end today. God offers us this freedom through Jesus Christ without price. His grace is poured out without end. It is boundless. It is limitless. There will never be an end to God's grace. That's the more that we seek. And there's always more of God's grace to be poured into us. And God is generous with this grace and mercy. And whenever we take hold of a God-breathed dream, then we long to be generous because we want other people to experience this freedom that we now know. Because we have been blessed, we long to be a blessing. Stewardship principle for today is very simple. We heard it in Proverbs. The borrower is slave to the lender. Living beyond your means leads to slavery and often leads you to become a hoarder of God's blessings. Living beyond your means often means you become a hoarder of God's blessings. A good name and noble character is worth more than riches will ever bring. And generosity leads to blessings. Paul writes, Jesus Christ died to set us free. Do not take this freedom for granted. And do not use this freedom to indulge your selfish desires, but rather serve humbly out of love. Live out your faith and share your love of God by loving and serving other people. Very simple. Free means being generous so that other people who are held captive to the dream are set free also. Anybody seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? Anybody? If you haven't, if you can get past all of the war concept, watch it. It's a phenomenal movie. It's a true story of a guy by the name of Desmond T. Doss. And it is a movie about selfless heroism. I don't want to spoil it for you, okay? But there's this one point in this movie where soldiers are suffering and dying on the battlefield. As the main character, Desmond, seeks to find them and carry them to safety in the darkness. See some metaphors here? The main character, and this is a true story, all right? The main character, Desmond, his goal is to go out into the darkness and seek out those who are literally dying on the battlefield. And in the midst of this darkness, the main character, Desmond, he prays this, God, just let me get one more. Just let me find one 
more. As I go out into the darkness to find those who are lost and dying, God, please just let me find one more. And that should be the prayer of our church. Because there are people that feel like they are in a battle. Their life is a battle and they are burdened and hurting and lost and broken and they are living in the darkness of night at all times and it is our responsibility to pray God just let us find one more are you a slave to the American dream Have you bought into a dream that has put you into bondage and all you long for is to be free? Are there practical steps? Do you need help that you can begin to take those steps toward freedom? Do you find yourself thinking, I would love to be a generous person, but the financial situation that I find myself in just will not allow it. What needs to change so that you are in a position to bless others? Free. It's free. Christ is offering you freedom for free. And that is a word that we love in our culture, right? For free. Buy one, get one free. You don't even have to buy one in this case. You get it for free. But you may have to let go of the materialistic dream that's been handed to you by society and take hold of the dream that God has for you. A dream of freedom. The choice is yours. So here's the deal today, all right? The deal with these commitment cards and the biblical principle of stewardship. Everyone has the ability to give something. Everyone has the ability to contribute something in support of God's church, God's mission to go out into the darkness and find just one more. And if you're part of God's church, it may mean that you have to give up something so that you can participate, so that you can be generous. And I realize that another, another um, um, characteristic in our culture today is a lack of commitment. We struggle to make a commitment. And some of it's fear of failure. Some of it is fear of being held accountable. And perhaps some of it is we have made a commitment to something or someone before and it didn't work out because the other person in the relationship didn't follow through on their commitment. So you have decided to remain commitment free. There's no commitment, there's no expectation, therefore if it doesn't work out, there is no feeling of regret. And I get it, I really do, because I have been failed, and God knows I have been a failure. But the reality of our church's finances are, the staff only gets paid through the gifts of you. The electricity that we enjoy, the air conditioning and heat repairs to our vans that transport our preschool kids and our youth kitchen repairs youth activities children's programs like children's church and wednesday night choir music support of our praise team it only happens through the generosity of god's people and no gift is too small mission trips support for local regional national and international missions assistance to the poor delivery of meals food for kids on weekends help through our flour and oil fund that pays for food shelter and clothing all these things only happen because you respond with a spirit of generosity and if you believe what we are doing at hillside is good and you want to see us do more then you're invited to make a financial commitment Regarding our mortgage, it's on that commitment card. I shared with you, we're down to 400,000 from 1.1 million four years ago. And I want to tell you, I've done the math. If every giving unit were able to just do five, maybe ten more dollars a week, it's not three and a half years that this gets paid off, it's two. It goes away in two years, just by five bucks skipping a trip to Starbucks and choosing to give it to something else. You're invited to carry the burden so that we can do more. And at the end, 
We may choose that we need to add more space. We may not. We may say, we just want to do more programs and, and reach more people. It doesn't matter, but it goes away. Most of us can eliminate just a little bit of excess to find a margin for generosity. But it's not a transactional relationship. So don't think, I need to commit more to God so God will commit more to you. God's already committed to you. God doesn't love you because of what you give. It, God's love and grace is offered to you without price. But because we have received this, we want to respond. So whether we give out of our le- excess and our leftovers or we give out of our poverty and our need, we're all invited to participate on some level. With that said, I believe God does not want something from you. God wants something for you. And I honestly believe that if given the opportunity, most of us would desire to be more generous. And our culture, our culture seems to celebrate wealth and prosperity, right? It's what we long to be, the accumulation of things. But whenever it is all said and done, that is a lie. That is not what we value. That is not what we celebrate. And when our time on earth is done, we don't list the accumulation of stuff in the obituary, do we? When time on earth is said and done, we don't say, this is where they lived. We're including a picture of their house. This is the car that they drove. They had four of them, by the way. These are the clothes that they wore. Look at their closet. How full. We don't list any of that stuff, do we? When our time on earth is said and done, what do we celebrate? The value of a life is measured by what was given away. At a funeral, we celebrate what the person gave away. The love that they gave to the relationships, the volunteering in local organizations, the generosity with kids programs and after school programs and then mothers and then fathers at Cub Scouts and Girl Scouts. That's what we celebrate. So why do we get caught up celebrating wealth and prosperity? I said last week as we talked about the mortgage, when people say, wow, how did you all do this? I tell them, I believe that this church is made up of some of the most generous people I have ever known. This church is made up of some of the most generous people I have ever known. And generosity begats generosity, which means that when one generous act is done for God's glory, it is magnified and multiplied to two or three or four generous acts. And those three or four or five generous acts are magnified and multiplied with God's blessing into six or eight or ten generous acts. And those six or eight or ten generous acts are then magnified and multiplied with God's generosity and God's blessing into sixty or eighty or a hundred acts of generosity. But it all starts somewhere so who will go first so I want to give everyone the opportunity your church wants to make it possible for everyone to live out your faith by being generous with others and we all agree whenever it's all said and done we celebrate what was given away not what was hoarded told you that today if you were present you would see something that 99% of you I'm certain 99% sure have never seen in a church service today any time in your life you've never seen this in a church service we are going to conclude our service with an offering being given rather than an offering being taken every person that is here, that is over the age of four, and we're not checking ID, so if your child can understand the concept of generosity, I want them to receive this. Every person over the age of four is going to receive a gift and a challenge. Everyone who wants to participate, you will be given a $10 bill. 
That's right. Your church is giving away money. And you can do with that what you will. You can fold it up and put it in your pocket, and no one will ever know the difference. There are no strings attached. But as an act of faith, your church believes that an investment in God's people is an investment in the community. Now, before your mind wanders too far, some of you all are doing the math and trying to figure out how many people are here today. And you're multiplying that by 10. And you're going, there's 150 to 200 people here. Yes, we realize that that means that between both services, somewhere between three and $4,000 will be given away today. Yeah. And your church doesn't have all this excess money in our coffers. But we honestly and truly believe as your church leadership in the biblical principle of generosity and we are not intended to hoard God's resources. And so we decided to put our money where our mouth is. Core value, one of our core values is go. Go. Go and be a blessing to our community. Go and live out your faith. So what are you supposed to do with your $10, all right? If you believe that the church budget is the best and most useful place for the $10 that you are gifted with today, you are welcome to put it back into the offering plate at the end of the service or next week, all right? You're welcome to do that with it. Or you can get creative. And you can take some time to dream. A God-breathed dream. And dream up just how big of a blessing can you be with your $10. Maybe you take your $10 and exchange it for a roll of quarters. And you bake up some cookies and you go to the laundromat on a Saturday. And you put quarters in washing machines for people. Maybe you and your family of four, who now have $40 between you, have discussions around the dinner table about stewardship and about how you can best use God's money. And maybe you decide that you know a family that's struggling to make ends meet and you're going to buy their groceries for them for the week. Maybe you add $10 to it because you want to double the blessing and you cover the cost of prescription drugs for a senior citizen that you know is worried about paying their heating bill, how they're going to do that and pay for their monthly subscriptions. Maybe you take your $10 and you put it toward the past due lunch of a kid at school. Maybe the homeless couple with the sign that says, homeless, anything helps, you use your $10 to buy a bag of burgers and it feeds them lunch and dinner. Maybe you put your $10 in the red bucket with person ringing the bell. Maybe your Sunday school class comes together and you get creative with a project and you pool your $10 together and you decide to buy coats for kids at the youth home. Maybe you buy Thanksgiving dinner for a family in need, blankets for the homeless, Christmas presents for a single mother and her kids. Whatever you can do, the opportunities are endless and your generosity is only limited by your heart and your imagination. And most of us have been in a position where $10 would have alleviated a lot of our worries for the week. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah. I hope doing this exercise of generosity that your family or your small group or your ladies' lunch group or your breakfast club or your Sunday school class or whoever will take some time in prayer together and some time in conversation to see how you can best use God's resources that have been entrusted to you. And how big of a blessing can you be? How would our world change if our dream was to love deeply, serve humbly, forgive mercifully, give generously, and follow Jesus passionately? And there are no strings attached, all right? So, first, I do have a couple things to request of you. If you're not expressing your generosity anonymously, okay? then by all means, tell the recipient or recipients of your generosity that this is a gift from God through you. And all glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving goes to God. You want none of the credit. And you don't need to tell them, my church came up with this idea. and it's No, this is a gift from God through you to bless them. And it is because of your faith in Jesus Christ and God's generosity with you. And you are a blessed individual that you want to bless another human being. That's request number one. Second request is we want to hear stories of generosity. 
Share your story. And we're not bragging on ourselves here, all right? This is not a spectacle of look what I did. We are spotlighting God's generosity, and it's all for God's glory. And so we're bragging on God. We're not celebrating you, the doer. So we want to hear. We don't need to know the recipient's name, but we would love to hear stories about how you got creative and blessed other individuals with your generosity. How did they react? What did you do? How was God glorified? Those are the two requests. Last thing before we start the end of our service this way. If you find yourself in need and you are here today, and you're wondering how you're going to afford gas this week or buy your kids lunch, then maybe the best use of this $10, it's intended to help you. Maybe this is God's generosity toward you so that you can make it through the week. I don't know. So don't feel guilty if you find yourself in that place. And the best use of that $10 is to help your family for the week. So, everyone present here today, over the age of four, again, we're not checking ID. So if your child is old enough to understand and have a conversation about generosity, they're invited to participate we're going to conclude our service by giving.